the New Brew Podcast. Let's dive right in. Hi, my name is Hema. Thank you for joining us on our Series 1 of Fear to Teach. Um, Today's Episode 5, we're discussing the fear of community understanding. I'd like to welcome our guest and Dr. Sandy. Please start us off with an acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Hema. I'm really looking forward to um, this podcast. So I'd like to just acknowledge where I live is in the Dakin Young country, and I identify as a she and her. We would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional owners of Australia. We acknowledge their continuing connection to land and water and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm really excited to um, meet Sharon today from the um, PSC. And I'm just going to share, as I always do as well, my quotes. And I know after me, Sharon will share, then Hema will. So I was thinking of various cultures. That was what I was thinking when we were thinking of this podcast. So I'm going to, I'm going to come up with two. Um, so one from Japan, which really fascinated me, and it says here, a father's goodness is higher than the mountain, a mother's goodness deeper than the sea. I don't know about you, but as a mother, that resonates with me. My heart is so deep, deep, deep um, in the sea. And I know if, um, from, my, from my experience, my own father was very much that high mountain, go, go, go getter. And I wanted to always, I like to go from, get one from around Africa because I have family, two nephews and a little niece from who, um, whose dad's from Chad. And I love the African proverbs they tell me about. So this one's from Tanzania today. Work the clay while it is still wet. I just love that. Sharon, what's your quote to start us off? I've picked a quote and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of the duck and young people too Um, because that's where I'm situated today. Um, My quote is one that I've taken. It's a a quote that I use quite often, and I hope that people people like that. And it's that education is the most powerful tool that that you can use. It actually changes the world. And I think that teachers need to know and understand the power that they bring to any and every relationship. It is indeed what will change the world. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon. So my quote is a reflection of my culture and my beliefs and the communal uh, effort that is that goes into everything, that it takes a village to raise and educate a child. So we all have a role to play as parents, as a community, as in teachers. So our question today is why do pre-service teachers have a fear of parents and the community? Where does it come from? So who else to ask than the parent representative, then Sharon Brownlee, who's been a parent representative at a state level. Um, Forgive me, I I would describe you as the godmother of parent representatives, Um, the mentor of of people who represent uh, parents, a wealth of knowledge. I am super excited and honored to have you as our guest today. Please tell us your story. How lovely. That's, that's a, wonderful, um, a wonderful welcome. Thank you. And perhaps the nicest one I've ever had. Uh, being a godmother is, is a very important role and I, and I take that very seriously. So thank you. Look, it's an absolute pleasure to be here because I truly believe that the primary years are by far the most important years. And it's where you get to know children. It's where you get to raise children as a parent, but also you get to know and understand and love and care for other people's children. And the best way to do that is to be in the classroom as a parent helper, to work closely with the school, to know and understand what's happening. And I think that there's a wonderful opportunity for pre-service teachers to really understand that they have the, uh, um, are the most powerful tool to help those parents to be better parents. And instead of it being the other way around about them being worried and concerned about the parents, I suggest that you treat them as partners and that you encourage And part of what you do as a teacher is actually help and grow those parents to be better parents. We just need to give you the right tools and the right support and the right environment to be able to do that. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Tell us a bit about your role uh, as a PNC or for our audience who maybe don't know, what is a PNC or maybe they know it as a PNF or a PTA? 
Sure. Okay. So in, in New South Wales and in most Australian states in the Education Act, there's a place for a parent organisation or a parent group. And so in New South Wales, it's called the PNC for public schools, but in the Catholic education system, it's often parents and friends, but in the public system in Tasmania, it's also parents and friends. And so that's a little bit of research that people should do to have a look at the fact that the parents have a role, a legislated role to work as partners in schools with, with, with teachers and principals. So they usually meet often in the day <clears throat> in a school. Uh, sometimes they meet in a, of an evening. So every school will have a different framework. Sometimes they meet monthly, sometimes bi-monthly or, you know, week three, week eight a term sort of thing. Every school has a different different model. But they meet and they get together and they talk about what's happening at school. And it's a, it's a positive place for parents to come together to share stories about school and education, not stories about teachers. In fact, in the Constitution, it's very clear you're not allowed to discuss individual staff, so teachers can always be reassured they won't be discussed at a PNC meeting. So what they'll talk about is um, what's happening at school, what's happening for their child, and it's a great opportunity for principals and um, assistant principals or deputy principals to come and encourage parents and talk to them about their role as parents in schools. And so that learning for them takes place through the PNC, and also it's a representative role. Often from there, they'll be on a merit selection panel they can then join their district PNC and go on to be on the state PNC and represent parents right across the state as high enough as on the, the NESA board or in the minister's office for regular briefings or with the, the Secretary for Education as they look at new policies, be it the new the policies that are coming out around special education. There's lots of meetings and discussions around those policies. And our state colleagues and where I've been um, as a state president and I'm lucky enough to have a couple of terms in that role, um, we get to be the, the advocates for parents at that most senior level. So PNC is really important for me and it's really important at a school level and I think teachers should really value that PNC and they might be asked to come along as a teacher and talk about what's happening in maths in kindy or what they're looking at in year six in reading and how they're going to manage the transition to high school. So there's wonderful opportunity in that formal space for teachers and parents to get together and really have a solid framework to work from and a formal meeting place rather than the informal that take place. Thank you, Sharon. So how many years have you been representing parents? So I've had the opportunity now for nearly 20 years to be in this role. Um, I started off as a very young mum with my children, the youngest one, not even at school, she was in free school. But my school was one of those schools that had this marvellous opportunity for me to know and understand the constitution and understand what the roles were and a very understanding hubby who thought it was a great opportunity for me to go and do some representative work. And so initially it was only a few weekends a year and a few meetings here and there, and it grew to much more as the children got older. And I didn't become state president until they were older. But I certainly valued those opportunities and living close enough to Sydney and close enough to, to headquarters for the, all the organisations, be they the Professional Teachers Council or Teachers Federation, I was able to whiz down and back and be home in and around their school time often. Um, to be able to engage in that parent role. So I've sat on panels without going on too much about myself. I really feel that people should know that every parent that comes through their door has the potential to take this role, and that is to be on the panels for the secretaries for the Department of Education, to be on the panels for who was the new um, leader of the, the consultants in the new mass programs, to sit down with the minister and talk about smaller class sizes and work in that area when we got smaller class sizes. I had the pleasure of being the, the PNC president when we did ethics in schools and sitting down with Simon Longstaff and the ethics centres. And we started ethics in schools around the New South Wales framework, the scripture in schools, which is different from other states. And we really wanted to make sure that children were not missing out and sitting in a library and not wasting the time that's mandated scripture time. And that's how we started Ethics in Schools. So I've had an amazing, amazing opportunities, a wonderful career. And at the moment, I'm the president for the Central Press Council of PNCs, and we do a lot of work locally. But from time to time, my, my old role um, calls on me and people who've worked with me elsewhere. Um, and I might be doing something in Armadale or something in the Blue Mountains, depending what else the need is for someone to work with the parents and be an advocate. So I have those opportunities to continue now to even do some more. And um, it's just been an absolute pleasure to take this role. And I think that parents can be the best advocates and supporters for teachers. And the opportunity for teachers to encourage me and to give me advice, information and, and facts along the way has made my role so much easier and so much clearer. And it's enabled me to really make sure that I could provide the right information in the right space and do a lot of media, I do a lot of radio and still some TV to talk about the power of education and teachers 
And it's lovely to have it come from a voice that's not an employee of the department or not someone constrained by the department's rules and regulations, but has the morals and ethics to do and say the right thing. And I encourage all of my PNC members and boards and colleagues across the state to do the same thing. And many do. And that means we're real partners in education. I love it. (laughs) I just, oh, wow. Thank you. Oh, wow. You're singing to my heart. (laughs) Mine too. You've just summed up my whole whole love of parents <laughs> I just oh so it would be so it would be fair to say that you've seen thousands and thousands of school communities correct Sharon yes I think that that would be that would be a fair comment too and so from schools in in, in Dubbo out to Woolgooga um going then out to Wagga down at Tankari all the way up to Lismore or out in the back to, to, to talk about what's happening at Lightning Ridge with the schools in partnership for the Aboriginal programs that we started at the state level um, with the wonderful Karen Jones, who's um, currently back in a role as the leader of um, Aboriginal education in New South Wales. We did some amazing work at Lightning Ridge to go out to Gadooga and see what was happening in those communities has been an absolute thrill for me and a real pleasure with Professor Tony Vincent to go and travel and look at mental health for the children in schools, to look at what's happening to support teachers, to support children who come from families that are troubled, that have had issues and have concerns. And no matter where that parent is in their life's journey or the problems that they have, they love their children. And even when their behaviour from time to time doesn't present that way, in their heart, they do love and care for their children. What we need to do is wrap around them lots of community support lots of school support to make sure that they can be the best parent they can. And sometimes, yes, we do need to intervene and do some other initiatives. But all the time I say to teachers that parents want the best for their children, the best way to do that is to get them an education. And if along the way we can educate and support those parents, we'll get them to re-enter education because many of them had had a really poor experience themselves at school and trying to get them to re-enter, sorry, education is probably another powerful tool that you can do. And again, having their own children at school frees them up and gives them an opportunity to look at their own life and value and education and to do something different there. So I've had those amazing opportunities in those thousands of schools literally now. And now that we're recording um, using video and audio, it gives you an opportunity for a wider audience in a different way. But I do think there was nothing nicer than walking through the playground and being in the schools and sitting in the classrooms as I've been able to do right across this state and indeed across the country because in my national role I could be at Balga in WA and sitting there in those schools and have a look in Tasmania what they were doing in the north in some of those colleges before we even had colleges in New South Wales you know about 12 15 years ago and so those amazing opportunities that I had all of that I bring to my knowledge and understanding and I have met some amazing teachers truly truly dedicated to changing children's lives and shaping their community loving what they do but from time to time thing, things happen with parents and they they spill over into schools it's about empowering teachers to know and understand if the problem sits with the parent and the parent community and things are happening outside it's not about them they're the professional they are always the professional and they're there for the children it's about using all the policies procedures and tools that you've got in the system to make sure that you're protected as a teacher but we're looking after those children and making sure parents know and understand their role. That's what I do a lot of now, more than just the pure representation. That's awesome. I'm just going to say that Hema and I have a fair few things in common, and one is I started teaching in Mount Druitt as an early career teacher. Um, so, and I, I, one of the things I got known for was um, a teacher that parents would come to. Um, I did nursing before I did teaching, so that may, maybe that may be more sensitive. But I would just want to share with people too, because you're making me think about this, um, and we shared this on the learning um, circles with um, Adriano de Prado last night with um, um, the School for Tomorrow. I would sit in the playground before the bell. I knew to just sit and watch. So originally I was sitting just to watch the students. I had year one and they were quite challenging. I actually had 38 often in my class. Yes, the good old days. So, um, yes, anyway, long stories. But basically I started developing a relationship with parents because I was sitting there. I was a young, I was, well, I would have been 27, 26 at that stage, and they would come and talk to me. And me being me, because as a nurse, I would, I would, I think nursing taught me skills of empathy and just actually to listen. 
So I didn't talk a lot. I would listen to them and ask them questions. And then as time went on, a lot of them were actually, um, not a lot, but a, a significant number were illiterate. And so they would ask me to do paperwork for them. And me being me, I was able to be really savvy and not let them know that I knew that they were illiterate. Now, the interesting thing, Sharon, is when I went to the Ride District, which is the opposite end of NAPLAN and basic skills, I met illiterate parents there as well. And it was really interesting. I did the same thing. I would sit in the, in the playground. Sometimes I would sit where people couldn't see me because I really did want to observe the kids in natural play, if you know what I mean, because kids are cool be kids. Um, and yeah. I have... I have seen some very awful fights on the playground between parents um, um, and that I think I can understand that fear, but you are, I just can't thank you enough for coming on today because you have just nailed exactly what I lecture on this topic as well. The idea that we have a position, we are professionals, we've got our boundaries and so do parents. So, but we can come together if we empower each other and listen to each other. And I've had um, parents like screaming at, in the playground at other teachers I've only happened to have had it happen to me once in my in my career. And he actually wasn't screaming at me. He was screaming about something else. And he came to me. And so I we would take things off the playground and then give them a cup of tea. Let them calm down and listen. Because I mean, I, I was gonna say this quote later on, but I'll say it now. Um, basically, Salt Sharon, um, sorry, Salt Marsh and Chapman in 2015 said this of a, a parent said this to them in a study. And I think it's really important to hear this. We only get one chance to raise our children. If we get it wrong or if we fail them in education, our family lives with that forever. Now, if you think that firm, that education is the only way through, which it's, it's a black and white way of thinking about it, but that told me so much about parents and it confirmed what I've always known. Parents, their number one love is their child. And they see education as the vehicle often um, and the, uh, like current schooling as a vehicle to get out of poverty, for example, because that's what I taught. I helped a lot of families get out of poverty. Um, and, I, and I just really want to add to you, add to that. Sorry, have I taken over? But I just was like going, yes, yes, you're saying yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Hema, over to you. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about the fear. Like I'm a believer that if we acknowledge the fear, we can go past that. Is that okay? Absolutely. I come, I'm a mature age um, pre-service teacher and a parent. So I've built that relationship with the teachers. So me crossing over to a pre-service teacher, I, there's no fear there. There's no fear there. So I'm surprised that there is a fear. Um, what is your take on that? Look, I think if you go back to being a student at school and going in for younger teachers who go straight to university, they're still very much in the subordinate role of being the student. They follow their lecturer. They, they may still be living at home where the parents are in charge of what's taking place. There's certainly other students who are out and living with their friends and in their community. But when they, you put them back in a school setting, they're still that, that young child themselves. They need to sort of progress into being their teacher role and not sort of being... The, the junior in the relationship, they need to become the senior person in the relationship. And I think when you're doing a prac or you're in there in your first stages of teaching, you're still very much the junior around other teachers. Um, even if you're a, when you're a mature age student, I think there is a different relationship with the teachers, principals and parents in the school. But when you're young, you may be as young as their younger sibling. And quite frankly, I think there's some young teachers that are older in, than some of our parents. And I think that Dr. Sandy would have experienced that in the school she's worked. Mm -hmm. I have certainly seen that where there are young, young mums and dads who are younger than the teachers that are coming into their school. And they bring, unfortunately, a raft of, of problems and issues. And if you've been raised, as many teachers have, in a very loving, caring, stable family environment, it's very difficult for them to comprehend these children have themselves have grown up in a most tumultuous um, relationship. And, and complex family where language and behaviour is, is the kind that we don't like to see. And so they carry those traditions on when they're stressed and angry. Some of them have their own mental health issues and they may have addiction issues, but their behaviours are ones that we need to address and to deal with. They are not behaviours that should be taken on board by teachers. And that learning, I think, only comes with experience. It comes with having really good 
um, and sound support in your university and when you're doing your practice in your school with your teachers. And I think the best advice you can give to a young teacher is to acknowledge that fear. Emma, I think you're absolutely right. And then to look for tools and vehicles to be able to manage it. And I think going back going back to your lecturers and saying, particularly when you've got someone like Dr. Sandy with you, to be able to say, you are that professional, you are that person, how do we deal with that? What was the specific issue? But it's not personal. You're just the teacher on the day at a moment in time when whatever was happening at home or outside it uh, overflowed into the school or overflowed into the classroom or impacted there. It's only because you're here today. It's actually not directed at you. And even if it's about the child and the parents' fear of how the child's going at school and what's happening, Fear in parents brings out often very, very poor behaviour. It's about empowering those teachers to know that it's really not directed at them personally. It's directed at them in their status or their role and then to use the tools that the school has, including, you know, their teachers uh, in line management and their principals and policies to be able to address those behaviours. But if we exclude those parents and we marginalise them even more, we marginalise their children and we set up a cycle that's repeated and repeated, the school refuses, non-attendees and no engagement. We have to break the cycle anywhere and everywhere we can. Most powerful people to do that are, are teachers of young children and small children in primary school to really empower and change those parents teach them how to behave and what you expect from them. And you'll be surprised, you know, they want to belong, they want to fit in, they know they're different. And they know that often just to be to be bold and to be brash and to look like you don't care and be rude makes them look cool. But underneath, they're as frightened and terrified just because they know they don't fit in and they don't mainstream. So it's really about knowing and understanding where they come from. And then as a teacher, you can do exactly what Dr Sandy did and sit in the playground and listen be there for them, don't judge them. And before you know it, you will have them there doing anything and everything for you because they really just want to belong and fit in. And often they can't work, don't work. They're not educated enough to achieve and time is heavy on their hands. And the stresses of even trying to be a parent when they haven't been parented well is difficult for them. And calling them out on it and directing them to parenting classes doesn't always help. It doesn't. I think it helps at all, actually, that, 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 in that way. So I, I, agree. I, I had, um, I was the teacher at Mount Druitt that had parents that would come in to help. And people would say to me all the time, but Sandy, how come you've got parents coming in? No one would come in. Now, the interesting thing was then the parent, teachers would go, oh, because they're bad pa parents. And I would go to myself, no, 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 you're not understanding them. Because my nursing taught me so much. And so reactionary anger is actually pain. And actually, if you know much about pain, it's actually grief. And often that grief is their bad experience at schooling. So when I would listen to them and ask them, what happened to you for, at, when you were at school? Wow, boom, I would learn so much. And I am very non-judgmental because I do, I have um, taught families with lots of drug addicts and so on, lots of wealthy people as well who are just as difficult um, or loving um, both ways. But, yeah, the thing is you've got to understand their, fr their frame of reference, their, their, their lens. So... Sorry, Emma, I keep on stepping in, but it's just such a good talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's an important topic. We all have our communities that we come from and we all have our, our own challenges. So it's just good for teachers to see, see our communities for what we can do. And give us a reason, as parents, give us a reason to come into the school. Non-judgmental. Yes. So this is a perfect segue. I was just going to say, you're absolutely right. Come into the school and find a little job or a little task for them to do. Be it only once in a while you need them to do something specific. Sharpening the pencils in the classroom is, is a good task. Doing uh, something yep. about helping if they can't help with literacy and they can't do reading in the classroom because they're a little they're illiterate themselves or they're struggling. Find other roles and things for them to do around the school so the children of those parents see their parents belong in the school too and they fit in like other parents do and they don't have to feel the odd child out or marginalised too and then that behaviour fits in where they feel that there's favourites and they're not able to participate. There's always a role and a place to give those parents a job and I say to the principals as well, look carefully at you know working bees around the school, a barbecue for dads in the morning, things that yeah. you do in your school to bring those people in to normalise their interaction with the school and the children's learning. And it doesn't always have to be academic. I know that's hard for teachers sometimes to understand when they're all about the academic, but really they will educate and raise those children in many ways. And I think that that whole caring and nurturing that Dr Sandy talks about in her own professional role is exactly what we need to give to all teachers to empower them because they are 
the, the leaders and the mentors in the classroom and the leader of the parents in their groups. Because it does hurt teachers' feelings when they are attacked. And I've watched it and I've, I've, I've debriefed with a lot of teachers. And I would add to it, you know, the idea of connecting with the, the actual elders of a community. So an imam came to me because where I was teaching Mount Jewett, a lot of them were um, a Muslim. He came to me and said, we've decided we respect you the most. We want you to be the connection. So they came to me and I went, okay, let's go for it. So, um, and then like Indigenous, the same with Indigenous. Every culture actually has their own, I think, elder, if, you, if we're really honest about it, or they're the person that's best known, they're the people to, I think, invite in. And then at the other end, the ones that are absolutely petrified who will ostracise themselves from the whole community. They're the ones, actually, for me, that always got my heart, and I would be the one. They would be the ones I would go and sit closer to on the playground because I knew they were the ones that were also ostracised by the community. Now I don't know about you, but coming into a playground, knowing no one, no parent likes you, that must be awful. So um, yes, yes, and not being embarrassed for your child. And I do a lot of work with the behaviour schools now, and the opportunity to be as someone whose who's parent, whose children have finished school, but, but I'm not a grandparent or anything yet, but in the community, there's always a place for a parent and a community helper. So I have a role in a couple of schools and so do, to, to, to groups of people like me around the state. But we do a lot of work in behaviour schools and those challenging behaviours and mental health issues and the chemical imbalance mm. children are born with because mm-hmm. they have drug or alcohol fetal children and their brain will only develop the way it is. When those children grow up and become parents, they are often the parents that the teachers are frightened of and fearful of. And you need to understand that sometimes that parent is only the victim of their yeah. own childhood and how they were born and what they've got. And we need to put in processes, of course, to protect and look after teachers and all the children on site, but also to understand that sometimes they truly can't be anything much more than what they've, they've been able to do because of the way in which their childhood was and what happened for them. And so, you know, I put that out there too, but I do think that Teachers are very gentle souls and they're very caring and nurturing and they spend all day, all day, caring for other people's children and nurturing them. And most parents can't cope with a birthday party for a few hours on a weekend when there's a group of children. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) It's a powerful tool for parents to go, how do you do this all day, every day? And so they're a bit in awe of teachers, even young teachers, and they're very aware of their own failures and fallibilities as a parent even what we'd call sort of your middle-class parent, they have their own fears and their own issues. And, you know, the teachers who work in those schools, as Dr Sandy said, those parents bring a different set of problems and competition and and other things in their roles too. So wherever you teach and whatever you do, you'll find a mix of uh, insecurities, um, brashness, and parents who need your love and support. And that's why primary schools matter so very much because what you can do is shape those young parents, mums and dads, and often you might have grandparents who are carers but you can even shape them to care and love for every child that's there to know and understand that schools have changed, that the system does value parent participation. They do care about all children. We understand culture now. We talk about um, with pride our Aboriginal ancestors. We talk with pride about our multicultural communities. You know, it, for me, the pleasure of starting Harmony Day 22 years ago with Dr Andrew Revshogi as the Education Minister was a very powerful tool down at the Marrickville May Murray Centre and doing a lot of work in southwest Sydney, really empowered I me. remember that. <laughs> do you remember them? I do, I, I do. Loved, loved my time there and loved the fact that those families were so big and generous and warm and they spoke differently and they sang differently and we'd have them come to a PNC conference and present and most people who came to conference had never seen those Tongan boys sing and never seen mm-hmm. dances of the islands and it was just the most amazing time to value the difference that brings us and makes us Australia. And I think the more we can celebrate the difference and value it and not be fearful of it, the better we will be. And I think that goes to then different kinds of parenting, different kinds of people. And I think that empowering teachers in that way, but really use the policies and the procedures that the system has in place. Talk to your um, supervisor at school and the principal and back to the university to make sure you get the support that you need. But all the time know that you're the leader and you can help lead those teachers, um, are, are those children and those parents around you as teachers. And often a teacher will say, that prac teacher was here and I watched the way that, you know, he or she interacted in my classroom and it made me think about my own teaching style. So teachers can't even be teachers of other teachers. That's awesome. Uh, we were, Hema, did you want to say anything before I ask some questions on prac? Did you want to add no, you go ahead. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? So, <laughs> so we so my PhD was the question was how do primary pre service students 
um, engage students in learning during professional experience. And so it's always been my interest to understand how other people learn to teach. And my passion's always been that pre-service teacher, early career teacher phase, because I think that's, you know, that's the most vulnerable time of any of us for our career. So thinking of Hema, and I do know Hema quite well. Um, I know she runs her, like the, the Tongan language school, uh, is involved in the Tongan language school, has lots of passion for taking kids out of the classroom, for example, take them out of that learning environment. So, um, um, and, and her profile on, our, on the Newbury podcast website is uh, beautiful. So my question is this, imagine Hema has been asked to organise a language lesson on PRAC and she is mindful parents will want to know about the lesson. What would you suggest Hema does? Okay, well, if, if Hema's in, in a school where they have a really good newsletter or school bag app, and I hopefully that she'll be in a place where there's really good communication already in a framework for, par for partnering with parents, provide that information and an opportunity through the regular means of communication, which is just telling them. She could also offer an opportunity for an evening or a morning to have the, the parents pop in for a sh very short session and just explain what she's going to be doing in the classroom. So teaching the parents what she's going to be doing and getting them to know and understand what's happening in the classroom. Parents get very nervous coming back into the classroom, even when they're an adult, but it really helps the young teachers get a feel that they're in control, even for a short period of time, just, you know, uh, to talk to the parents about what they're going to do. And then the mainstream teacher can talk about other things or the principal might talk. Or you could just say, we're going to have a 10-minute morning tea to talk about what's happening in language in the classroom. I suggest all of those things for a community where you can bring people in and they then get to know and understand you as a human being. The trust and the respect is already there. And then off you go and do what you need to do with and around the children. I think that's where you start to really break down those barriers and become the person that they know and respect as much as the teacher is teaching their child that sometimes they're in fear of. Oh, Hema, any other questions? I think that's covered pretty well. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> I actually love Hema's voice. I would just like Hema just to talk to me like on, on a meditation tape that I could listen to it. Um, I meditate every day. I just like, I could just listen to Hema now. So, so moving on to question two. So mindful of that idea that Hema wants to take kids out of the classroom. So some parents don't find that um, easy to understand because they want their child to sit on the floor and be engaged that way. So imagine Hema has heard there is a parent who may come to the classroom um, and they've been around before um, and probably after the school bell, they'll come to um, Hema, possibly might be a little bit concerned because that's something that I think a lot of early career teachers are worried about, that the parent's not going to be happy with their stuff. How can Hema politely support the parent? And what we're really saying is put in boundaries as well. Yeah. I think you need to have those boundaries. So hopefully in the school, um, they have a system of, of boundaries and behaviours where there's an expectation that you make an appointment before you come into the school, that you go through the front office. And if COVID's done nothing else, it's made sure that people sign in and mm. they have to identify. Workplace health and safety for me was actually the catalyst where you could say to people, you need to have your visitor's badge on before you can be in the school. You must go to the front office and sign in. And just having to do that formality often snaps Anybody who wants to come in and, and sort of have a little bit of a rant and it breaks down their opportunity to sort of just free fall into a classroom. But in some small schools and in some school settings, at, especially at bell time when there's a lot of movement already around the school and they're not going to the front office because they're picking up children, um, they may just come down to the classroom. So all you can do as a teacher is to make sure that you have really clear boundaries. If somebody just arrives at your door, you give them your best smile and say, oh, hello, how are you? Look, I'm sorry, I can't stop now. I'm just about to go over here. I'm needed in the staff room. We're having a staff meeting. Um, look, by all means, make an appointment to come and talk to me. If you don't feel you can stop right there and they're, they're quite... Um, they're quite worrying you and you feel unsafe and uncomfortable with them. Just keep moving, walk past them and around them and go to where you feel safe in the staff room and back into the main part of the school. But if it's a parent you think you can deal with and you can manage, what you can say is, look, I, I hear what you're saying. And often parents can't articulate what their concerns are. By the time they get to you, they're usually so fearful they blurt out something that's inappropriate. Um, so what you need to say is, look, um, can we make some time to talk about this? I really can't stop now. We really need to sit down. I, I understand that you're worried or, and I haven't explained that well for you. Give them all the power back. Yes, yes. Right now, you've got to write there if you don't understand exactly what's happening. But we need to make a time where I can sit down and stop. And you must always be the busy teacher who doesn't stop, who can't be stopped. You must be on your way somewhere because as soon as you stop, 
and you start and you sit down and explain to one parent one afternoon, the next thing you'll have is another parent, another parent, and they will do it to you multiple times on multiple days. So you must from day one get your boundaries right so they know what's expected of them and then you can put in place things that work for you forever. Even if you're a prac teacher at that school and every school, you want to set the tone and the messaging around what you do, that they're not in charge of you. You're in charge of children and your duty of care is there. I want you and everyone wants you to work with the parents, but it's got to be in a situation where there's an equal power and understanding about time and they're not to demand of you more for them and their child. And on the other side, you'll have those parents that are very pushy that want to demand you do more for their child and they may entice you with, you know, gifts and donations and bribes and all sorts of things. And you need to manage them as well as the aggressive parent. You need to make sure you've got those boundaries in place and that you are calm and measured. Do not engage with them. Don't interact with them. Move away from them. Don't feel fearful of leaving them in the classroom or leaving them at the door. You have to protect yourself in the integrity of what's happening in the process. Don't be drawn back into any sort of conflict or conversation with them. Um, and there are tools. Unfortunately, there's the Enclosed Lands Act. And, and if need be... Uh, if there's any real violence and that's very very rare it is rare yeah that those parents isn't it dr sandy come in and just want a minute of your time that turns into half an hour they share their life story the next thing you know you're becoming the counselor and while that's an important role for teachers in the right setting it's not when they confront you one-on-one so really use those tools and those boundaries and, and psych yourself up as a young teacher And a prac teacher to say, because I'm young and new, I might find that I'll have some parents or some people here um, trying to address me. I will do this and I've got these strategies in place for how I'll manage that. I know my way straight to the staff room. I know who to go to or to the teacher next door if it's first thing in the morning and it's class time. Know where to go and what to do to make sure that you're safe around that school. And even safe from the fact of giving you time because once you start with one parent, they'll be back and they'll be back again. And, and you set it a tone that's really difficult to break then without getting to a point where you have to dismiss them um, or they'll tell the, other, <laughs> tell the other parents that Miss, Mr or Mrs so-and-so is a great teacher, you just need to go in and just be right there and then you're distracted from the teaching of the children because you're dealing with the parents. It's and that's, yeah, they're the boundaries, aren't they? Like, absolutely, absolutely. That's why going out in the morning was masterful. I didn't realise at the time it was masterful, but I realised later on because the bell was my boundary. Yes. So as soon as, so I would only be out there for 10 minutes. I, I'm not saying I was out there for hours. I was just out for no. 10, sometimes five minutes. But yes. that was masterful because the bell would be my friend. Oh, sorry, I can't yes. talk to you today. Let's yes. make an appointment. And be exactly. like water off a duck's back because a lot of this emotion, they settle down within two hours of the emotion and they can listen to you. So, um, and yeah, and, and I'm very proactive. I take it on the front foot. I, I'm the one that will say, no, no, no. It's, I've got this data here or I've got this evidence here or I, you know, I'm the professional, you know, and I, I'm very much, I've been like that since day one. So, and I found actually won people over because yes. they, gained, they gained a respect for me because they went, she knows what she's talking about. Yes. So, and I think yes. that, um, that's the thing that a lot of early career teachers are frightened to, to do is to say, well, actually, you know what? I do know what I'm t- talking about because exactly. you do, because you've just been to uni for four years and you, you know, you you've learned so much. Because yes. teaching is such a hard thing to do. But we, I'm conscious of time. So I'm just wondering if we can just get one more tip for Hema and early career teachers. So I know Hema really wants this idea of supporting the island kingdom um, of Tonga community because that's her passion, um, so South Pacific uh, and so on. She's not keen to teach in the classroom. All right. So is there yes, a hearing that. Let, yeah. me, let me clarify. Uh, I want to be a specialty classroom, like community languages, there's a school's program. Ah, okay, sorry. Yes, yep. yes, and it's a Saturday program, yes. And also in the schools as well. Yes, yes so there that's is, That's yeah. where I want to be, but uh, the principals need to, well, when you were talking, it's so important to have that community languages, that culture in their schools. Um, how would you give me some advice on getting into a school? <laughs> Okay, well, look, I think that, you know, the same as any language teachers in a school, I think it's the most powerful thing you can do for for children, whether it's their first, second or third language, is to have that opportunity for language and culture. I think it really, it's, it's a framework for them knowing and understanding themselves, as well as knowing and understanding those around them and the rest of the world. I think the power of languages is amazing just generally speaking, and we don't give it enough credit at all in Australia as they do around the rest of the world. So I think having having the opportunity for all children to participate 
in cultural and language for Tonga would be just awesome. And I'd love to see it, you know, right across the board in every school. I think the opportunity to talk to principals about the benefits that you bring and to take children out of the classroom to have an experience is, for me, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's the same as taking them out to be the professional sports one where they miss maybe some mainstream lesson, but they're representing in sport. Everybody's very understanding about everyone going and kicking a ball or throwing a ball. And, you know, that, that's awesome. And we just have, um, and we should celebrate, you know, great athletes. But if they're off to do the debating challenge and represent this school, they're allowed to go off to do that. And if they do other other events around the school and school captains are often out and doing formal events. So to take children out of the classroom, for me, is not a problem at all because I actually think children are very clever at catching up and marking time. They learn different things when they're outside. If they're doing a Tongan lesson, I think that would be a wonderful opportunity. Children who've got uh, literacy or numeracy needs are often taken out of the classroom to do special catch-up lessons and targeted one-on-one support. So I think that, you know, in and out of the classroom, and, and teaching outside is becoming a really big thing again in the new designs for schools. So being out of the classroom, learning in small groups, learning with a teacher or a prac teacher or an SLSO or a parent helper in small groups, um, doing a maths program out in the, um, the weather shed or outside the classroom, lots of opportunities. Good schools and good principals really allow that movement around their school. And so I think having that conversation with the principal about what you bring and what you're able to do and also maybe finding an advocate in a school where they've got, um, you know, a, a clever principal who knows and understands it doesn't all have to happen within the, the rigid boundaries of, uh, of a classroom for every child, for every subject. Certainly, mass is often space and measurement is often better learned outside the classroom as they get to really know and understand about volume and size and space, things you can't do in a small classroom. I've seen some of the best mass lessons there. And the smaller lessons for languages and talking to children in different settings down in the library or out in, 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 the, in the weather shed or in other opportunities are things I have actually seen with my own eyes. And I found that to be really, really helpful. And so I think that. Emma, building that relationship with the school, getting them to know and understand what's happening. And I also think that finding a, um, a friendly director or two is often helpful too because they'll help identify a school. And once you start and you've got those good relationships in a school or two, be careful because the next thing they'll want you in each and every school, you'll have to have a group of um, <laughs> people who want to be out there and delivering on that because I certainly know some very monocultural mainstream schools that could really do with some diversity and some opportunity to celebrate some other language around what they teach in their schools. And I think that, Hemmer, in any way that I can help you, you know, there's still connections there. And I know you've got some good friends and mentors in some other people too. But what you bring and what you're offering is something special and unique, and we really need to value that. Hemmer's amazing. I just, oh, just, oh. I can't comment. I can't compliment her enough. I wish we could cut and paste Hema. And each time she's on the podcast, everyone says, Hema, please talk more. Please talk yeah. more. So Hema, what would you like to say about all this? <laughs> um, I'm still trying to process it. <laughs> yeah. I talk a bit quickly. Sorry. It's all the years of doing radio and trying to get a lot of information into a small space. I think Hema, be yourself, build relationships, mm. to know the teachers and the principals. And use your advocates and even use that small group of community mentors that Dr. Sandy talked about, who are the adults and the elders in those communities to talk to them about what's involved there. I think it's about giving confidence to be able to know and understand that what you're bringing is something unique and special mm-hmm. and that it is to be valued and understood. And it's not a favour and it's not for you, it's for them and it's for the children. And I think it's going with that mindset and understanding that, that you've got something very special and unique. Um, to bring is really important. And I know there's been many, many conversations over the years about community languages and why we have them, how many languages are taught and what happens. And every time this is brought up, people come out of the woodwork and, and talk about the power of when they were at school, the opportunity to have language and to be able to talk to people about culture. They may never have been home. It might be several generations since they've been there, but they really, really need to know and understand their heritage, their history and their culture. And even those who haven't been there and don't come from there, they often benefit too. So, Hema, I wouldn't wouldn't give up. I think it's a really powerful and so important for a trained quality teacher to be able to have language is something unique and very special and we need more of it. Thank you, Sharon. So that that time in our podcast that we are, 
ask Dr. Sandy for her pearls of wisdom. So pearls of wisdom was in my PhD and, you know, the string of pearls and good teachers will have one bit of wisdom, another, another. So what I'm going to do actually is I like to be really practical and hands on. The first thing I would say to everyone is this, what is the evidence parents use to decide whether a a good school or not? Or, um, and that's really important because it gives us an understanding of their lens and their expectations. And these are the things I think of when I think of, well, what makes them like they are their childhood, their own schooling, of course. Now we've talked about that a lot, but there are other things that I think are really important because they want the best for their child. And a lot of parents now know to read things on the internet. All right. So they go and read what the news media says, but they more read things like NAPLAN, um, the My School website. And of course, they're going to want to look at that data because that's how we've set things up. I'm a qualitative researcher, so I would be, I, I don't actually, I think we should be balancing it better, but we're not at this point, and I hope we, we will. Where else do they go? The soccer field, the netball field, the yeah. local swimming lessons. How's that teacher? What's that teacher like? Blah, blah, blah. Playground chat. Or because they care, all right? They actually care. So if you think about when you care, you will research the most about that topic because you care. Well, I don't know anyone that, you know, I I think that's the thing. And then there are some parents who don't have the tools to research. So they don't know what to do. And all they know is their child's coming home crying every day and they don't know why. They don't understand why. And that's why that connection with parents is so important. And I, I always go to myself, why are they upset? Why are they doing that to that teacher? Why are they um, coming in every day and just hovering around like a bee around their child? And I, I, that's why I mean. I, I'm, a, I'm a watcher, I'm an observer, and I'm a listener. Um, and, and so from those, I go, I think I understand you. Um, and then I might sometimes get it wrong. So then I go, okay, I haven't quite got it right. I need to rethink it. So that's why I always say relationships first, and it doesn't have to be complicated. People think it's really complicated. You're spot on. The sharpening of the pencils, what do they like? Watch what your community likes. Do they like soccer? Do they like rugby union? Do they like AFL? Do they like football? Um, You know, that type of thing. So, and then from there, engagement is essential. Um, and that is my PhD. So the MUNS project, um, which I talk about a bit, I, I read that and that was the beginning of my PhD. That was the birth of my PhD because there were kids that were saying school is not for me. So, um, and, that, and that's so important. Um, so we've given a lot of tips. I'll, so you could probably listen to the podcast again. And then, and the other one um, is be strategic. All right. It's not just, it's a, this is, I think a, a lot of ideas have been great and they've not taken off because they're not as strategic as we could be. Um, and if, for example, what I mean by being strategic is if it doesn't work, you don't just chuck it out. You go, okay, why is it not working? What can we take that is working? Because um, I have a very inclusion oriented lens. So I always say to people, start with what is working and then push forward, push forward, push forward, and don't give up don't give up. So, um, I mean, for example, from our professional point of view, eights will stand at seven tells us we do need to professionally engage with parents. But for me, I don't find eights are actually very helpful because I do it anyway. <laughs> um, so it's not something that had to be told to me to do. Um, and actually, all my friends are the same. Uh, we, we just naturally want to do these things. Be mindful of the evidence. What is What it, do we know from research? Um, you know, um, what don't we know about your community? So go and have a look to find out. Um, and then the other one, which, which is a classic because engagement is my area, noise in the classroom. Parents look and go, oh, your classroom's noisy. Oh, they can't be working well. Well, one school, um, they got me in to assess the school. It was quite entertaining. I was not say entertaining, but I found it amusing because it was a four, five, six, and the parents were saying they're not engaged because it was too noisy. They even got expert scientists to come in with hearing tests to see how loud the decibels were in the classroom. That's why I found it amusing. But in the end, I won them over because they had to come and do a talk to the point the parents were begging us to not change the noise. So because there is a thing called the, what I call engagement of noise or engagement noise, and, some, and I mentioned in my PhD, that is actually why my classroom is always the noisiest in the school, um, because there is learning is active. So and I, I get kids to meditate every day so I can calm them down. Um, I'm very good at teaching meditation and we meditate a lot during the day, but we'll also go and dance as well. So, um, because I'm very much into five century play with learning. So, Sharon, the question is, 
Um, our second question is, if you had a million dollars for pre-service teachers, what would you suggest that we do with that um, one million dollars? I think with that one million dollars, I would take it and I would free up some teacher time and I would take those pre-service teachers out into some of our more complex and diverse schools and give them some real time uh, in those schools to get to know and understand those communities and bring those communities in for those events that I, to, you know, that I talked about, free up the money. And I think that surprisingly, food draws in, you know, families, have events and occasions, have multicultural days for lunches, bring in food and people will, will help and, and provide food as well. Have those, you know, um, sausage sizzles and barbecues uh, in the morning to bring the dads into school. Free up that and have some of your um, your money go towards that and also free up some, some teacher time. You know, a million dollars is a lot of money, but I think that what you could do is for those prac teachers to give them time, some more time to stop, mm -hmm. think, to research and to feel comfortable in what they're doing and in the classroom to give some teacher time. So maybe you put a casual teacher in to a school for a day and the mainstream classroom teacher can give a whole day with that prac teacher and they free up the time in the classroom and free up the time in the school because I think at the end of the day people get a lot of pressure and they're very busy and children are very busy little people generally speaking and the day flies. I think freeing up some time and giving some time is helpful. I think really education for adults and education for teachers even long-term teachers is a really important thing. So for me, professional development and support and money invested in teaching teachers and money invested in bringing in and building community is always a good use of money. And I think that that's where the really strong partnership with the university, really strong partnership mm. with your academics and the research that builds on teacher training that was used in, you know, Teach New South Wales framework, that's used in the quality teaching framework. Those research-based evidence really take away mm. the and the fear for teaching they're demonstrating mm. work they've got practical application you, you can hold that research up for the teachers and the principals around you and the parents and use that as your evidence to go forward and so I think building those partnerships taking the time using the resources and if it takes to pay for casual teachers and you need to use that money to invest there I don't see it as a cost I see it as an investment and I think that we can always use more money to be able to build those really strong external partnerships with the academics because they are the ones that will demonstrate to senior people in cabinet and senior people in the department what works and what works well and why. And we need that evidence to be able to we do. Yeah. build on best quality practice that's in schools. Thank you, Sharon. I just want to thank you for your time today. It's been um, an amazing yarn. And I'd like to ask Dr. Sh Dr. Sandy to share today's episode's word of encouragement. So we'd like to end off with a words of encouragement. So, um, and so um, we do a little hashtag, Sharon. Um, so our first episode okay. was intelligence before emotion. Um, and then we said dive in mentality. Um, we've also said keep an open mind. Um, now, this one actually is a word of encouragement because it's actually to encourage you to succeed. And, um, and I've been thinking as, this, um, as the a podcast goes, what would be the best thing to say as an encouragement? I actually think boundaries matter. And that actually is a word of encouragement because it's empowering us as teachers to actually succeed in our own practice. Um, so, yeah, so I would mention that. Hema, what are you going to do with your section of the website? What, what, what visions have you got there for, there for us? I would definitely want to do something uh, bilingual, something for parents. I think I will do uh, something. Wait and see. Watch this space. <laughs> what we're doing, Sharon, is we're actually video diarising the journey with their first lesson plan. So, um, so if you get a chance, you could go and have a look on their website um, yeah. where yeah. Natasha and um, Kyle did Indigenous to, um, this week. And that what they're doing is videoing as they go. So because this group, um, there's two podcast groups working. One, they've not done prac before. The other one, they've actually done prac a few times. So they okay. can show the other end. So Hem is going to show us the journey with her first lesson plan. And there's me, but not just me. I've got friends who are teachers and researchers who are coming in and supporting. Wonderful. And we call yeah. that we call that learning circles. So this yes. is a fear to teach podcast, but those yes. podcasts are learning circles and they're uh -huh. mini versions of it. And they are, they're diarising their journey with their first lesson plan. 
um, in their chosen area. So, and yes, but Hema and I have been talking and we really want to add to her section that parental community feel, which is a, um, for someone like so me who's taught, yeah, for someone yeah. like me who's taught forever, it's easy. So you might want to come back and help with our Learning Circles podcast. I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to. And you know, Hema, the quieter and the more gentle and the more caring and compassionate you are, not everybody has um, needs to be um, to be talked to and with. That building that relationship and being that calm, gentle, trusted person really parents will gravitate towards you children will gravitate towards you and just telling the pre-service teachers to stay calm to be engaged to be the professionals that they are is often a very powerful tool as well um, I do think sometimes though that all teachers are a little bit all performing or all, all acting also grabbing the audience at the front of the room I, I think that there's there's that about all teachers but I think the quieter part about the learning and your passion for your subject area, passage for language, that real passion, that will come through and it's something new and exciting. And if parents haven't experienced it and you need them to know and understand the difference, use the research that talks very clearly about children who do better right around the world who've got more than one language and more opportunity. And I think, you know, I truly know that my children benefited from the language teachers and what they were given and their opportunities to open the world and they, and even myself in my own education the language opportunities that gave me a chance to know and understand different cultures, we shouldn't lose any of that. And English isn't the only and the best. It is the current and it's our language of our, of our country. But we need to really value and understand other languages. I cannot impress upon people enough to value, to really value those and to, to value the South Sea Island cultures. It's not, no disrespect, I think French and Italian and uh, are very important. But I think that, you know, those who did Latin will tell you, you know, it's got its strengths too, but we really need to value those new languages of our new communities and to put them up on the pedestals where they need to be. So go out there and be really brave and and um, and know that you've got something unique and very, very special to offer. And if there's anything I can do in the schools and the communities I'm in, we'd be very happy to have you. And we've got some awesome principals that I work with in some schools and some of them work, Dr Sandy, out in Tregear and out in Mount Druid and... Mm dealing with some very complex families and situations and lucky they've had experiences like yours because they don't become overwhelmed by some of the behaviours of parents and the communities and they're really good at boundaries too and so they're the powerful lessons you need to do and I'd be very happy to work with you again. You're an amazing woman, Dr Sandy. And oh, thank you. It's awesome and anything you bring and through your lens is going to be very, very powerful for children but also for parents. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed talking with you, Sharon. I, um, yeah, I just love learning myself personally. Um, so that's the end of our podcast. Would you like to end off for us, Emma? Thank you so much to our special guest, Sharon and Dr. Sandy. Uh, this whole yarning just reminds me of, um, of a saying that my father says. Uh, it's a concept of friction. When you need friction... When you're rubbing your hands together, you need that friction and with that friction comes warmth. We need to be rubbing our hands together, rubbing our shoulders together and working together collectively for our kids. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone so much for listening to our fifth episode of our Series 1 Fear to Teach. If you're interested in some of our resources, be sure to check out our website. It is www.thenewbrewpc.com. We offer an extra subscription that contains some extra resources and bonus episodes. If you want to sign up for Prac Hub Plus, it's $10 a month. And be sure to check out our socials. It is Twitter and Instagram, The New Brew PC. And remember, hashtag Dive In Mentality. <laughs>